Hello, friends, and welcome back to Emmaus Presents. It's a joy to be with you again. My name is Vern Steiner, and this is our third study in the Book of Psalms. In our introductory discussion two sessions back, I briefly noted the five major psalm types, psalms of lament, psalms of praise, psalms of thanksgiving, psalms of confidence, and psalms of the alphabet acrostic. In our study today, we are considering Psalm 13, an example of the first of those categories, a psalm of lament, a, a prayer cry for help, a psalm in the pits. Once again, let me encourage you to have your Bible open to our psalm, Psalm 13. Psalm 13 unfolds in three stanzas of two verses each. There's a problem in verses one and two followed by the petition in verses three and four, and finally, the praise in verses five and six. First, the problem, verses one and two. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Did you hear the fourfold cry of desperation, each introduced by how long in a crescendo of heightening intensity? How long, how long, how long, how long, O oh Lord? But the details are left vague. We're not given any information on what the circumstances were that caused this psalmist to cry out in such anguish. And that's interpretively instructive. The psalm is left sufficiently general so that we can use these words to express our own anguish whenever we find ourselves in the pits. This cry is, is expressed in relation to God and self and enemy. In reverse order, the enemy is winning, I'm hurting, and God, you're not helping. Have you ever been there? Do you know of anyone who has? I do, many in fact. Doubtless even today, many of God's people find themselves in such a pit, in these extraordinary times of upheaval and uncertainty, of death and disruption. This is a psalm of great realism for many, many of God's people. But what do we do in such times? Well, we, we pray, of course. The, the, the irony is that, that we should pray, though, to a God who, who seems to have forgotten. But what else should God's people do? We pray. But what does one pray in such times, especially to a God who seems to have forgotten? This brings us to stanza two, the petition, verses three and four. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. It's a twofold petition. The first part is simply one more cry to the Lord. Consider and answer me. Pay attention, Lord. Look at me. The second and longer part addresses the problem of this enemy winning. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. Enlighten my eyes. Here's an important key to understanding this psalm. The psalmist has now identified that the problem is not really with the Lord. The problem is with his vision, with his spiritual eyesight. The cataracts are blurring a vision of God, and so it seems that God is completely out of focus, that God has forgotten and forsaken. And so the prayer is, Lord, open my eyes, enlighten, bring light to my eyes, help me to see you once again as the God that you are. And it's in answer to that prayer that we come to the praise of verses five and six. But I have trusted in your merciful love. 
My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Suddenly we are confronted with the primary interpretive question in this psalm and in others of its kind, how to account for the abrupt change of mood. Some have proposed to explain it from outside the psalm. Well, it's easy. The circumstances are all better now. The psalmist is no longer in the pit, but, but that won't work. There is no hint of that in the psalm. It's much more likely that the psalm is now praising because of a renewal of spiritual vision. He's praising while in the pits. The prayer is answered and praise pours forth. But how is it answered and why is there praise? It is not in the removal of the problem, but in the renewal of the psalmist's perspective. The situation has not changed, but God is back in focus. But we might ask, to what in particular has God enlightened the psalmist's eyes to see? To what does God enlighten our eyes to see in our own moments of darkness? The key lies in the expression merciful love in verse 5, but I trust in your merciful love, which translates the Hebrew word chesed, H-E-S-E-D, pronounced chesed. 246 occurrences of this beautiful word in the Hebrew scriptures, more than half, 126 of them, are found in the book of Psalms. Chesed is the, the wedding, the coming together of love and loyalty, of mercy and devotion. Love is expressed beautifully on the lips of Ruth in that exquisite story we find earlier in the Bible, where she says to her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. Where you spend the night, I will spend the night. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you're buried, I'll be buried. And, 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 and she even goes so far as to take an oath saying, uh, in effect, I'm not going to let even death separate us. So much does she love her mother-in-law. That's chesed. Chesed is illustrated in the animal world in the contrast between the ostrich who lays her eggs in the sand where any other creature can come along and smash them. And the stork, on the other hand, who finds a secure branch and in a tall tree and builds her nest and lays her eggs and hovers over those eggs and, and will protect them, come what may, even to the point of her own death. So loyal is she in her love to her young. And when the ancients needed a word by which to name the stork, you guessed it. They chose the word chesed and gave it a little different ending. Chesedah. Chesedah is the Hebrew word for stork. Chesed is love that is stork-like. It's love that is so loyal, it will go all the way to the death. And of course, that takes us all the way in to the New Testament and the story of the cross. So the perspective is regained that results in praise. It's a perspective that's oriented, reorientated, shall we say, to chesed. And so in verse 6, the psalmist comes forth praising, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He's dealt bountifully with me by opening my eyes to see again that God is chesed, and in chesed there is no forgetting. So he's praising not necessarily in the removal of the trial, in deliverance from the pit, but in renewing, in the renewing of perspective, the reorienting to chesed once again, in the midst of the trial, while still in the pit. It's the perspective we hear from the prophet Habakkuk at the end of his book, Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not blossom, nor fruit be found on the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's feet. He makes me tread upon my high places. May God grant each of us a similar outlook during these times of uncertainty and upheaval or in whatever pit we happen to find ourselves in life. Thank you for the privilege of spending these moments together in Emmaus Presents. Until next time, let's fix our gaze on the chesed of the Lord, in which there is no forgetting, no forsaking, whatever our circumstances.